Welcome to this talk titled Driven by the Nines. It's a talk all about high availability and disaster recovery features that are available on the Microsoft Data Platform. Now, my name is Gethin Ellis, and this talk is for people with little or no knowledge of SQL Server high availability and disaster recovery features, but perhaps would like to know more about these features so you can possibly use them to help deliver a stable data platform going forward. And I've got some nice simple demos to show you of the technology in action as well as we make our way through the presentation. Now, if you've got any questions as we progress, there is a Q&A pod in the Zoom interface. Uh, tap your questions in there and I will answer them at certain points as we uh, make our way through the presentation. So let me give you a little bit of information about myself. I've been working with SQL Server for nearly 20 years. In that time, I've had a variety of jobs from report writer to web developer and database administrator. For the last 12 years, I've been running a small consulting and training business, gethinellis.com, and lately we've partnered with our good friends at Wyden to offer cost-effective end-to-end solutions in the following areas. So we do things like date the platform architecture and design so we can design highly available and, and, and solutions that will meet disaster recovery requirements. We do SQL Server migrations, including version upgrades and migration to a range of cloud providers as well. We can do SQL Server health checks and tune-ups, and we can offer training on the Microsoft data platform as well, including Microsoft's official curriculum of courses. Do feel free to follow me on Twitter. I am at Gethin underscore Ellis. Connect with me on LinkedIn. I, uh, I connect back and it's always ni nice to make connections. And if you've got any questions on the session today, do feel free to drop me an email. My email is on the slide there. It's gethin at gethinellis.com. Now, Microsoft Data Platform comes with a plethora of high availability and disaster recovery features. And some of these features can work hand in glove with each other to allow you to configure your SQL service to be both highly available and recoverable should the worst happen. So if you've got strict service level agreements and uptime is key to your business, combining some of these high availability and disaster recovery uh, features in SQL Server is something you're probably going to consider. Now, in this session, we're going to look at SQL Server availability groups, we're going to look at uh, SQL Server failover cluster instances, and we're going to look at log shipping and how we can use these features to keep our SQL servers and our data platform highly available, but also maintain a disaster recovery site should we need to move our services to a different location. Now, before we move on, we need to define some key terms. Uh, and understanding these key terms can help us answer important business questions that will ultimately define our high availability and disaster recovery strategy. So when we talk about high availability, and high availability and disaster recovery can sometimes be used interchangeably. They're not, strictly speaking, the same thing. With high availability, we're looking at what we can do to minimize any downtime. And the goal here is to minimize or mitigate the impact of downtime on our SQL servers. Disaster recovery, or DR, if we lose critical infrastructure, can we run it somewhere else? Okay, so our DR efforts address what is done to reestablish our services in the event of an outage. Now, this could be restoring a database from uh, a previous acceptable state using a backup. We might be utilizing redundant redundant systems that have been implemented and maintained to take over the running of our mission critical databases in the event of a partial or complete failure of the primary system. And that failure could be sort of natural disasters. Anyone had a server room flood on them? I oh, know I've had that unfortunate experience, but it could be technical failures as well. And then lastly on this slide, we have got recovery time of uh, the recovery time objective. So how long do we have to recover our databases? From a SQL Server perspective, this is the targeted time within which a service or a database must be restored after the disruption. Okay, And if we recover in this time frame, we're going to avoid any unacceptable consequences associated with a break in this business continuity. Then we've got recovery point objective, or to put it another way, how much data can we afford to lose? So this is the age of the data that must be recovered from a backup or secondary copy of the database for our normal operations to resume. Okay, um, 
Uh, recovery level objective, this is what needs to be available to get our services back up and running. So it's looking at the granula granularity of what we need to recover. Now it might be a file group in a database, it might be the database itself, it might be the entire instance, it might be a suite of servers. Okay, so what you need to get up and running to get your critical services going again. And those last two definitions were really related to disaster recovery. What we've got on the screen here now in this table, uh, when, when we're talking about high availability, it's usually expressed as a percentage of uptime in a given year. So if you're driven by the nines, it basically means you've got quite strict service level agreements that mean the data platform you support needs to be available for the majority of the time. Now this can be measured as a percentage of the time your database and data platform need to be available. Now in the table, it shows the downtime that would be allowed for a particular percentage of availability. So assuming the system is required to operate 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, the figures here represent a measure of the downtime that would be allowed for a given percentage. So in the first row in the list here, we have got nine fives. Okay, so this could be useful for perhaps a system that needs to be available nine to five, Monday to uh, Friday. Outside of this time, the system can be unavailable. Okay, so it needs to be available 55% of the time during the year, which represents nine to five, Monday to Friday, but you can have outage outside that. But you probably need to note in your service level agreements that the critical time for the availability here is between nine and five. Now in my career, I've probably, I've definitely spent some time looking after nine fives, but also probably at two nines and three nines, which two nines is about three and a half days a year and 99.9% .9 uptime is approximately eight and three quarter hours. Now the others in the list, the four nines, 99.99, .99, and then 99.9999. Uh, not so much SQL Server is capable of delivering it, but as you go up each hundredth or tenth or hundredth of a percent, the cost of delivering that solution goes up as well. And obviously, you're going to have these discussions with your business. You're going to ask questions like, how much data can we afford to lose? And then when does it need to be back up again? straight away okay well here's the cost for this it comes in at 50 million quid with all the redundancy and all the various servers and dr sites we've got built in and then someone uh, who makes these, these financial decisions might actually say ah okay well we can probably take a four hour hit and uh, uh lose up to half hours worth of data and then it kind of dictates to you what what technology you need to use in your solution now <clears throat> the microsoft data platform features that can be used to help us deliver both our uptime and our RPO and RTO objectives. We've got failover cluster instances. Now this is primarily a HA feature, so it'll minimize that outage should, should a node fail. We've got availability groups, which offer both high availability and disaster recovery. And we have log shipping as well. And log shipping is primarily a disaster recovery feature. Availability groups, failover cluster instances, and log shipping, they can be used in a variety of ways, okay? And sometimes they're not used just for uh, high availability and disaster recovery purposes. Obviously, there are two of the ways they are used, but log shipping in particular can be really useful for migrations and upgrades, and I've got a scenario I'll describe later on in the talk uh, where we look at uh, migrations and uh, upgrades and using log shipping to minimize the outage there. Uh, but, but availability groups have multiple copies of the database and log shipping has multiple copies of the database. You can use those secondary copies to scale out your reads as well. Okay, and we look at, uh, um, now spend some time looking at each of these features. Now what we're going to focus on in this talk is what's available in SQL Server on-premises. We're not really going to touch the cloud. That's a discussion for another presentation, I think. Now, Microsoft have got a technology in their server operating system that can be used as a foundation for a couple of the technologies I've mentioned uh, to allow you to build an on-premises set of servers that have got a degree of redundancy and fault tolerance built in. Okay, And then from there, you can build on top of that to provide high availability and disaster recovery for your SQL servers. Now, what I'm talking about is Windows Server Failover Clustering, or clustering, okay? It's not a particularly new technology, it's been around for a long, long time. 
And for those of you who haven't, haven't come across uh, a failover cluster, it's a group of independent computers or nodes that work together to increase the availability and potentially the scalability of a clustered role. Or a clustered role could be thought of as a clustered application or a clustered service. Now, these clustered servers, they're connected, if they're physical tin boxes, they could be connected by physical cables. If it's uh, configured on a set of virtual machines, then it could be virtual networking involved, but they're connected together and they can communicate one another, uh, with one another. And then if one of these nodes fail, the other node is able to take up the running of that service. And that change of ownership and change of running the service is known as a failover. Now, in addition, these clustered roles and clustered applications are proactively monitored by the Windows Server Failover Clustering Service to verify that they're working properly. If they're not working properly, the cluster is able to restart them and move them to a different node as well. Now, SQL Server, a SQL Server Failover Cluster in instance utilizes Windows Server Failover Clustering. And this is going to be the first of these uh, features we're going to look at. And Windows uh, SQL Server Failover Clustering, it gives functionality to provide local high availability through redundancy at the instance level of SQL Server. So we're able to fail over the entire instance from running on one node to another. Okay, so a failover cluster instance, it's a single instance of SQL Server. It gets installed across multiple Windows Server Failover Clustering nodes and potentially across multiple subnets uh, too. Now the cluster appears to be an instance of, singles, uh, of SQL Server running on a single computer. But in fact, it's the failover cluster provides failover from one node in the cluster to another should the initial node become unavailable. Now, in order to do this, we need shared storage between both nodes. And in the diagram on the screen, you can see we've got two nodes and we've got some shared storage that are used for storing both our system and user database data and log files. This shared storage can be in the form of cluster disks, it could be disks on a SAN, it could be um, file shares on SMB, okay, but it needs to have that shared storage. Uh, just bear with me for one second. Oh, sorry, should we be seeing some slides, Geth? Yes, you should, guys. Apologies, I'm just rattling on here, am I? Am I not sharing these slides with you? Can you see them now? I hope you can. All right, apologies, guys. You've missed a little bit here, and I'm busy talking away. Okay. Apologies for that. I will carry on though. Hopefully you haven't missed much in terms of diagrams. This is, this is really the first one. So I was talking about the cluster needs to have some shared storage. As you can see there, we've got two nodes in this cluster and they've got some shared storage. <coughs> the storage can be in the form of cluster disks. It can be disks on a SAN. It can be uh, files on an SMB file share. Now, all the nodes in the failover cluster have the same view of the data. So when a failover occurs, they both see the same thing. But what it does mean is uh, the shared storage has got the potential to be a single point of failure. And the failover cluster depends on the underlying storage solution to ensure the data is protected. So there's only one copy of the database. Um, and when you've got this, this setup, if you lose the storage, you're going to need to recover it in some way. So if to lose this database here, we don't have a copy anywhere else, we're going to need to restore from a backup. All right. Now, with a standalone instance, if you get a hardware or software failure, the applications or the clients connecting to the server are going to experience downtime. And this is where failover clustering offers some benefits. Um, a SQL instance is configured, when it's a failover cluster instance, as opposed to a standalone, uh, the entire instance is protected by the presence of these redundant nodes in the cluster that it can then run on. So only one node in the cluster is going to own the SQL Server resource at a given time. Okay, And then if we get a failure, or if we're doing a planned upgrade, uh, the ownership of that resource is moved to another node, and that node takes over the running. Now, the failover process is technically transparent to the client or application that's connecting to SQL Server. 
And this minimizes the downtime the application or client is going to experience during the failure. But whilst it fails over from one node to another, it's worth noting there is a small, there can be a small amount of downtime. So if you get a connection during the failover process, as we'll see in the demo, um, you will get connection refused. You need your applications to be programmed to try again. So it has a number of benefits. You get protection at the instance level. It fails over the entire instance from one node to the other. So it's all databases, all system databases, TempDB, your agent, your jobs, everything. Okay. The failover is automatic, and you can detect for failure and failover automatically. And it can be combined with, for example, availability groups or log shipping to give you that local uh, high availability, but you get another copy somewhere else. So you can combine it with other technology, so you get local failover, but get multiple copies of the database somewhere else, and we'll look at that in a little bit too. There are some limitations to clustering, and I've touched on some of these already. While you weren't uh, looking at the slides, you were probably looking at me uh, sweating away here. Um, <laughs> But it does have some limitations. It's, it's quite an old technology. Um, and recently, I've been involved in the development of uh, an online course where one of the contributors actually argued clustering was dead. Uh, the argument went that cloud providers don't really support it all that well, or in some cases, don't support it at all. And it was argued that nobody uses it. Now, I've got lots of clients that actually still use clustering, and in my experience, out there in the wild in production it is used quite extensively still and even at this time I think a HA and DR course would have something missing if clustering wasn't mentioned so we included it okay but it does have some limitations it's primarily a high availability feature so there's no DR unless it's combined with some other technology you get one copy of the database you've got a potential single point of failure and you need to consider virtualization too so we've got two if you've got two virtual machines so you've got a two node cluster and two of those virtual machines run on a single hypervisor host and you lose that host, you lose your entire cluster. So you need to configure your VMs to run on different hosts in your, in your virtual uh, virtualization solution. Now, with failover clustering being a HA feature, it can help you maintain your level of the nines. If you remember back to the, well, you didn't see the table, I'll go back to it for you guys because you didn't see it when I was talking about my uptime table. We look at the, the three nines here, we get eight and three quarter hours of downtime in a given year. Just find where I got to. Okay, so with, with eight hours downtime a year, if you need to do things like patching of your virtual machines and your SQL servers, you can patch the non-active non nodes first, fail over, to these previously uh, uh, inactive nodes or passive nodes and then patch what was the active node, okay? Doesn't really help with RTO and RPO, but it does really help hit your service level agreement and your uptime that you need to deliver. Now I've got a little bit of a demo here, which uh, we will look at. I've got, a lot of this is set up already, so in an hour I didn't have time to build a cluster and install a, a cluster instance or even build an availability group. So these are all set up in advance. But what I've got here, I'm going to look at Windows Server Failover Cluster. We're going to look at uh, the Failover Cluster Manager. This is sit outside of um, SQL Server, but as a, as, a, as a database administrator or someone who's looking after SQL Server, you're likely to want to um, at least have some access to this. I'm going to show you how things are currently set up. I'll show you how my shared storage is configured, how my Failover Cluster instance is configured, and I'll show you how the failover between the two as well. And then I'll look at some of the questions that might be in the in the QA pod. So I'm just going to drop out of the presentation for a second. And then I'm going to drop into my Hyper-V uh, setup here. I've got one, two, three. I've got seven VMs on here. One is a domain controller. One is used for something else. And I've got three nodes that make up an availability group. What we're going to focus on first is node one and node two of my cluster. So I'm going to connect to my node one. Uh, let me just drop off this for one second. Okay, and I'm just going to go into, if it's open, failover cluster manager. Now I've got a cluster here called, this is a Windows Server failover cluster called DPLAO. 
And if I click on roles, we can see I've got three roles running on here. Two of these are availability groups and one is my cluster. Okay, and if I click the resources tab at the bottom here, you can see my cluster name is DPL SQL. And if I expand that out, you can see it has an IP address. It's got, uh, it's running the server and the agent service. And we have got some shared storage running as well. Okay, and we can see that the owner of this node currently is node one, which amazingly is the, uh, uh, the node that I'm currently on. We look at the nodes, in, this, is, this is the failover cluster, uh, this is the Windows cluster, my SQL Server instance, my failover cluster instance is configured to run on node one or node two. These others are not part of the SQL Server uh, failover cluster instance, but they are part of the Windows cluster. Now I click on storage and I click on disks, and I've got my SQL shared disk. Uh, it's presented as the S drive. So if I go to the file system on this machine, we can see I've got a cluster disk here with my SQL Server data and log files on there. Now, if I want to connect to my cluster, I connect to the, the network name that we set up. So I'm not going to connect to the computer name. I'm going to connect to DPL SQL. I'm just going to disconnect from that just to show you working and I'm going to choose DPL SQL in Management Studio and it opens up. Okay, now this is all running on node one. If I run, I select that at server name to get the name of the server, it tells me it's DPL SQL, so it's giving me the SQL network name. Now I'm going to run a quick select here from my finance database which is sat on this cluster. Okay, and then we're just going to pull out one row back. We're going to pull out Ken Sanchez and then we are going to just update Ken's first name to get in. Okay, now this is in an open transaction that hasn't been committed. If I run this in the session, it will give me the dirty read there. So it's told me that uh, Ken has been changed to get in. But now if I initiate a failover of my cluster role and move it to node two, and I'm gonna select the node and I'm gonna choose node two, I'm gonna click on okay. This will take the SQL service down and it will restart it on DPL N2. So all being well, we should see it come back up on DPL N2. It does take a minute or two. So if you were getting connections to this now, your connections would fail. They would be uh, refused because the SQL server is not online. We just put the IP address online, just put the storage back online. We're starting up the SQL server and we are good to go. So if I go back to Management Studio and try my select again, it says a connection has been broken. Okay, so I'll execute one more time to reconnect. We can see the open transaction has been rolled back. So crash recovery on the second node has meant that any open transactions have been rolled back. And if we run select that that server name, we still get DPL SQL back. So we've we failed over locally, in-flight transactions have been lost. And for that, that, that period of time where we were failing over from one to the other, there would be an outage. But if you were, if you if for example we lost node one here and it failed over to node two, keeping that uptime, that percentage of uptime under eight hours for the year, this could be really, really useful. Okay, so I'm going to just take some questions from the pod. And I think most of these, David says we can't see the slides. Uh, yes, good. Uh, Geth can't see the slide deck. Okay, you should be able to see the table, Gibbo. Oh, mate, can't see the slides. So I've answered all those guys. You should now be able to see the slides, which is fantastic. Let me jump onto chat just to see what's in there as well. Yeah, you can see them now. Brilliant. Okay, so let's close that one down and close that one down and I'm going to restart my presentation from my demo slide. Okay. So the next feature we're going to look at is availability groups. Availability groups or AGs, uh, it's, it's a SQL Server feature that provides high availability and disaster recovery. It's introduced in SQL Server 2012. So from a SQL Server perspective, it's a reasonably new technology. It's probably the newest technology in uh, the on-premises SQL Server stack. Now it makes use of Windows Server failover clustering, but you don't have to install a failover cluster instance. You install standalone instances of SQL Server. And the protection is at the database level, not the SQL Server instance level, which is what, what clustering offers. Now, availability groups are intended to maximize the availability of a set of user databases. 
It supports a failover environment for a discrete set of user databases. So all these da databases can fail over together. I like things like, for example, a CRM, a dynamic CRM or a SharePoint farm. They all will have a, a set of databases that you want to fail over together. Availability groups, there will be one read-write primary, and then there can be up to eight sets of corresponding secondaries. And you've got the options of making these secondaries readable, so you can offload your report into them. And you can offload some backups as well, can be carried out on these secondary replicas. Now, the availability groups offer a number of benefits. And, and when they were released in 2012, they were kind of a, a big enhancement on a whole bunch of features that already existed. Um, but some of the key benefits, there's multiple copies of the database, potentially across different sites and different data centers. So for that reason, availability groups are both a high availability technology, you can fail over locally, but you can also fail over across data centers too and have a DR site. You can have up to eight secondary replicas, which you can use for offloading, reporting, and running certain admin operations like full backups and log backups. Differentials aren't supported on the secondary instances because they have to update a differential flag in the database so it needs to be writable so they're not supported on the secondaries now with an availability group where you're writing data from your primary to a plethora of secondaries there are two commit modes and how you set up your commit mode will depend on what you want to achieve something called synchronous commit mode where the primary replica sends a transaction confirmation back to the client when it's been confirmed that the secondary replica has hardened the transaction uh, to disk okay now using this synchronous mode there's zero data loss but because you are replicating data from primary to secondary and then waiting for an acknowledgement back there potentially can be a higher latency so this mode is recommended for high availability solutions where the nodes are potentially in the same geographic region with a fast connection between the two and the availability of the data, the data availability is more important than performance. Then there is asynchronous commit mode. Now in this mode, the primary replica sends a transaction confirmation to the client when the log has been uh, hardened at the primary replica only. It doesn't wait for the transaction logs to be hardened at the secondary. Now this mode has got a lower latency because it doesn't have to wait for that back and forth to the secondary but it does have the potential for data loss. If you get an interruption while transactions are being sent on the primary, that data can potentially be lost. Now, asynchronous commit mode, this is recommended for DR solutions or disaster recovery solutions where the nodes are usually separated by geographical locations and you haven't necessarily got the bandwidth um, between the two. Availability groups offer automatic failover and automatic client redirection. Through, through the form of a listener, and you can have automatic, manual, and force manual failovers. Now, to do the automatic client redirection, you use a listener. And if you set up a listener for your availability group, uh, you can configure read-only routing as well. Now, what this does, it allows any read intent connection to be redirected to a readable secondary. So there'd be nothing that you would need to do to send your uh, read intent connections to a secondary. It will be taken care of automatically by um, by the listener and by, and by the configuration on the availability group. So the, the latest and greatest feature, there are some limitations to them. System databases can't be failed over yet. Uh, so you, because of that, MSDB is not there. Uh, you need to ensure that jobs on your standalone instances, if you need jobs that are, uh, are going to run regardless of where you're running, they need to be replicated or, uh, or recreated on all the different replicas, as do your logins because they sit in master. And also, if you're reading from your secondary replicas, you're going to need a license for those uh, replicas. Now, availability groups, they can give rapid failover, like clustering, but it's at the database level, not the instance. So again, it can help towards maintaining your percentage of, the up, uh, percentage of uptime. If you've got a 99 or 99.9% .9 uptime, they can help with that. But because there are multiple copies of the databases, potentially in different locations, you can use this to deliver on your recovery point and recovery time objectives as well, because you've got a pretty much up-to-date copy of the database sat on another site waiting to go should the worst happen. You wouldn't need to take time to do the restore, and that database is going to be pretty much uh, up-to-date in the event of a failure. So they can help with RPO and RTO objectives, as well as maintaining your uptime and delivering on the nines too. 
Okay, so I've got a demo um, around availability groups. I've got a three node availability group set up, uh, and I'll talk you through this in a minute, and they've got different sync modes. One is configured for automatic failover. We can see how we can set up the backup preferences. We can look at how we can connect to the listener. We will look at read-only routing as well, and we will look at the dashboard, and then we'll take any other questions that are in the chat pod. So I'm just gonna drop out for um, a second, and I'm gonna come out of this VM, and I'm gonna go to my Hyper-V solution. Now, the three nodes in this availability group are my PR, HA and DR nodes here that I've just highlighted. And I am currently connected to my PR instance. I'm gonna just scooch up here and minimize that. So I'm connected to a few in here. I'm just gonna disconnect this one. And I'm gonna wait while my machine is now crashed. That's always useful for me. I'll take a drink while I wait. As you can see, I have patience, but not that much. There we go. That's when I disconnect that one. So on my PR instance, I've got a finance database, and you can see there it says it's in a synchronized state. Now, if I drop down to um, the high availability folder here, you can see I've got an availability group created called DPLAG, okay? And if I'm just gonna show you very briefly, these nodes are part of the same cluster um, that, that I configured earlier on and, and is running my, my, my failover cluster instance. But the service here has been enabled for always on high availability and you can see it's part of the same cluster name so when you're configuring this you need to set this up uh, on the instance and then if i expand my availability group we can see i've got three replicas in here i've got pr ha and dr now if i right click and go to properties of my availability group on the first screen here we can see we've got the availability group name then it's doing some uh, health detection stuff so we can fail over automatically i've got automatic failover between my ha and my pr uh, nodes and then i've got my dr site i'm using uh, a manual failover process and i'm using asynchronous commit mode so there'll be no data loss between these two and there's the potential for some data loss between my dr site they're all readable as secondary so i can offload my reporting my reporting to them Click on backup preferences, you've got four choices. You can say whether you want your automatic backups to prefer the secondary, uh, the secondary instances for backups. It can be secondary only. You can say primary only, which you might need to do if, you, if you're running differentials as part of your backup strategy, or it could be on any replica. And you can set a priority for those backups as well with the higher number being the highest priority. And I've also got set up on here um, a read-only routing. Okay, so if I click on my PR node here, I've got a read-only routing URL, which is basically my server name and the port number. And then I specify which servers I want it to round Robin. So it should go to HA and then DR if I connect with a read intent connection. Now in order to do this, I need a listener setup. And you can see there, I've got my DPL AGL, which is my listener for this availability group. And I'm gonna just click on connect here. And I'm gonna choose database engine. I'm gonna choose DPL. AGL, so I'm connecting to the listener. I'm gonna specify the finance database, and I'm gonna say I've got a read intent, or application intent is read only. So I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna connect you, I'm only gonna be reading. If I hit connect, it connects for me, and I'll do a new query. I'll do a new query when I get two seconds. because what I want to do is run a uh, select at at server name here, and you can actually see it on the screen. I've got DPL AGL, I've run a select at at server name, and it's directed me to the HA instance. But I'm hoping, if I open a new query window, it takes me to DR. So when I run this before, it sent me to HA, and it's able to round robin your reads as well, so you're not just inundating one 
uh, secondary node, it's able to round robin them for you too. Then if you want to monitor the health of your availability group, there is something called the availability group dashboard. So you right click the availability group, go to dashboard, and it will tell you the health. So you can see there, my HA and PR are in a synchronized state. There is no data loss. Because I'm using asynchronous replication to DR, it's in a synchronizing state. So it'll always say there's a potential for data loss here. Okay. And we can fail over uh, between, between these nodes if we want to by running through the, uh, the failover wizard. Okay. So next, I'll go back to the slides. Um, and just before we do that, are there any questions in the pod? Uh, we are thinking of adding async replica on a different domain. Is this replica? Uh, is this recommended, Ian? I'll um, I'll take the time to answer that at the end, mate, if that's okay. Uh, there's absolutely because I'm going to talk about domain independent availability groups next. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I don't think as long as you've tested uh, that it works fine for you. And I'm assuming that's the. Uh, the configuration you're going for. Cool. Okay, so read only replica requires an extra license. Yes, David, a read only replica does require an extra license. If you're reading from your secondary, we'll talk I've got a slide on licensing a bit later on as well. Um, if you're if you're reading from a secondary you will need an extra license. And I'm just going to get rid of some of these. So they move to the done pile and I'm going to move on. Okay, so this brings us on to the next bit we're going to talk about is some of the sort of, I'm going to call them edge cases for now, but they're not. Some of the more, the newer features that have been added to availability groups since they released in 2012. When it came out in 2012, Availability groups were an enterprise-only feature. Um, and then when they released SQL Server 2012, Microsoft marked a technology called database mirroring as deprecated. Now, availability groups, and I, and I wrote a course on this years ago, um, and I said, pretty much, availability groups are database mirroring on steroids. They do a lot more, they've got a lot more features in it. But what database mirroring had that, that wasn't included in availability groups was, was some ability to use it in standard edition. And in SQL Server 2016, Microsoft have introduced the concept of a basic availability group, which is basically availability groups for standard edition. It's got a subset of the features that are available in full-blown enterprise edition. And it is essentially a replacement for that mirroring feature that's been deprecated. Now, a basic availability group, you can have one database per availability group and a maximum of two replicas. You can't read from the secondary replica, okay? And it's only there in case of failover, okay? So when the secondary replica is gonna take over from the primary, and you might find that it has to use synchronous commit mode as well. There'll be some lots of other little features that are just not available in basic availability groups. But it does mean you can do it in standard edition and you can have your clustering and availability groups combined using standard edition because those features are available in both. And we've got something called a distributed availability group, which is what Ian might have just been talking about. It's introduced in SQL Server 2016. Um, a distributed availability group is a group of two separate availability groups. The groups are part, that are part of a distributed availability group can be on-premises, or they can be a cloud. They don't need to be in the same location. They can be cross-domain, which is where I was going with Ian. Um, they can be in different Windows Server failover clusters. They can be on different platforms. So SQL Server 2017 introduced the concept of SQL Server on Linux. So you can have a, one availability group on Linux and another on Windows. Okay? But as long as the two availability groups can connect and communicate, they can be part of this distributed availability group. Now, this can be particularly useful. This distributed availability group can be useful for disaster recovery. It can also be useful for migrating your databases to a new hardware or new configuration, okay? And if you need more than eight replicas, which is the current limit, it can span multiple availability groups too. Then there's a concept of a domain independent availability group. Now, traditionally, AGs have required 
that each node be part of a Windows Server failover cluster and join to a single domain, okay? Because Windows Server failover clustering up till recently was dependent on Active Directory domain services. Windows Server 2016 introduced the concept of an Active Directory detached cluster or a work group cluster. And this allows you to deploy an availability group on nodes that are perhaps deployed on different domains or not joined to a domain or a combination of domain joined and non-domain joined nodes. And these are referred to as domain independent availability groups. Now we can combine availability groups and, for example, clustering to get the benefits of both technologies. It's possible to combine a failover cluster instance and an availability group. This gives you the ability to fail over the whole instance, jobs, logins, databases, locally using the failover cluster instance. So you get a level of failover while using the availability group to maintain a second copy of the database, providing you with DR. This is particularly useful if you're on standard edition and want to try and uh, implement high availability and disaster recovery solutions using that. So you can combine uh, you can combine these technologies together to help you deliver your uptime service level agreements, reach the highest percentage of uptime possible whilst being able to move your data platform services to a different location in a reasonable amount of time, maintaining the nines but delivering on your RTO and RPO objectives too. Uh, and as I said, this would work very well um, in standard edition. You could have a two-node cluster in one data center and a two-node cluster uh, in another with uh, clustering providing local failover and the availability of providing uh, the database copy on the other side of the cluster. And now I've got a little demo on this because I've got this set up. Um, I've got my cluster, my DPL SQL. I've got it added as a, a, a to an availability group, and I'm going to show you how we can fail over the cluster and then fail over between the failover cluster and the DR instance as well. So I'm going to jump back onto my node one machine here. Okay, and we can see there I'm currently running the cluster and the availability group is currently running on node two. So if I expand always on here and expand availability groups, you can see my DPL SQL. AGCL, bit of a mouthful, uh, has got, uh, is set up and configured on the cluster. And if I look at the replicas, I've got my cluster name and I've got my DR server. And if I look at my databases, I've got my finance databases uh, in there. Okay. Now, if I, I'm going to do the same again here, it's, it's the same copy of the database, execute this. We can see we've got Ken Sanchez. In an open transaction, I'm going to update Ken's first name to get in. Okay, and I'm just going to do a quick select server name. We can see we're on DPL SQL. Then I'm going to fail over using failover cluster manager, the, uh, the, the, the failover cluster instance. So I'm just going to move that, select node, and I'm going to choose node one. Click on OK. And we'll wait. It takes the availability group down. It'll move the storage across. It'll bring everything online again. And everything's coming back. Waiting for the SQL Server. Agent has started. Everything is back. We're in good shape. And the availability group is online as well. So if I run this now, so the connection has been broken. It returns the same server name, but we have changed. If I do my select, okay, fabulous. My in-flight transaction has been undone, which is what I expected. What I'm going to do now, I'm going to commit this change and run it again. One will affected, execute. But what I'm going to do now, I'm going to fail over my availability group. So we've had a we've had a flood at. Um, GRE towers and our server room is in a bit of a state. So we, we've got a, a data center somewhere else that we can use for running running this service. So I'm going to fail it over. So I'm going to choose a new primary replica. And it's telling me that my, my um, DPL DR instance is in 
good shape to go. I'm going to connect to it. I'm going to click next and I'm going to click finish. Expand the details and hopefully we will fail over to our DPLDR. Now, I think what I've done here and what I should have done here is connected to my listener because what uh, wasn't what hasn't happened here if I do this again it tells me I'm on my DPL SQL but I think I've got a listener and I have so I'm going to connect to my listener here DPL SQL A G C L L click on connect and that would direct me to the active node. I'm going to do new query. I'm going to run that again. And it's, you can see it's taken me to my DR node. I can run my select statement again. And this time we'll see that the committed transaction is there and the data has been replicated across. Cool. Okay. There's no fresh questions. There doesn't seem to be anything in the chat either, which is good. Then I will move swiftly on. So the last technology we're going to talk about, and we can't really talk about high availability and disaster recovery without mentioning really log shipping. We've spoken about availability groups being the newest, uh, the newest HA and DR technology. Log shipping is one of the oldest DR solutions in SQL Server. Log shipping is a process that automatically ships or copies transaction log backups from uh, of a specified database on a primary instance to one or more secondaries and restores them there. The secondary instance restores these log backups individually, maintaining a copy of the primary database on the secondary. Now you could combine this with clustering in years gone by in days before availability groups to, to give you that DR solution. Um, and it's nice and simple, isn't, there's not a lot of overhead attached to it. There are some drawbacks though, there's no automatic failover and there's no automatic client redirection. You'd have to do that uh, manually yourself. Now, you could say with the uh, advent of availability groups, there's not a lot of need for log, log shipping these days. Well, potentially, yes, but it still has uh, a few use cases. So the primary, uh, primary use of log shipping is to maintain one or more copies of a SQL Server database. It can be used in migration from one, uh, moving databases from one instance to another. Okay, and we'll talk about that in, in um, a little bit. But you configure log shipping between the current and the new SQL Server instance, and then just perform a failover to the new instance when needed. Log shipping databases, they can be used as read copies. Okay, but that is obviously going to be between restore jobs, so it depends how frequently you're restoring as to whether that's going to be useful for you. But you can reconfigure that delay as well. So if people are happy querying from a copy of the database that's maybe 24 hours out of date, you can run your restores um, overnight. And it can be really helpful for um, recovering from a bad update. You know, if you ever run an update or a delete with no wear clause and you affect all the rows in a table, then you've got a copy with, with those old values in that you can use to perform an update back the other way. So it does still does have some, some uses. My main use of it is in the form of uh, database migrations and used to minimize downtime there. So there are some limitations. Um, it's a database by database basis. So if you've got 100 databases, you've got to configure it for 100 databases. There's no automatic redirection. So you have to fail over the clients and applications manually. Uh, and the readability is limited. So users will get kicked out during, during a restore. As I said, I use this a lot um, when I'm doing migrations and version migrations in particular. So log shipping, we can use it in, in the upgrade process to keep our outage window really, really small. So what you do, you set up a restore copy of your database well before downtime. Now let's just say this is a database that's terabytes and terabytes in size. You can copy that over well in advance, restore it on the new, new version of SQL Server. You could be going from 2008 to 2017, for example can restore the logs in that database on the new instance, keeping it warm, <coughs> restoring them with no, no recovery. You can move your jobs, you can move your logins, you can use something like uh, SP Help Rev Login to move your logins across seamlessly. Then when it's time to migrate, apply that last log backup, take the old database offline. So if you've forgotten to redirect any connections, they get an error message. 
recover the new database and redirect your connections. Now it's a manual process, it lends itself well to migrations because you can fully control uh, when the database restores take place. But it really can help if you go back to the table of the nines and you've got three nines and you've got eight hours a year downtime and you need to do a version upgrade, you can really make that, that window small that you need an outage for to do that upgrade uh, of, your, of your key applications. Now David touched on this uh, in a question, how much does all this cost? The answer is, in true fashion, it depends. It depends on the addition of SQL Server, whether it's standard or enterprise, um, if it's physical or virtual, if you're licensing for maximum virtualization, if you've got software assurance. Software assurance adds 25% of the cost of your licenses, but you get some cool stuff thrown in with that. Now, I'm not gonna go into all that here. On the, on the slide there, I've got the shelf prices of SQL Server that I picked up off the Microsoft website um, a few weeks back. Uh, and these are for SQL Server standard and enterprise editions. SQL Server Enterprise is licensed on a core license basis, whether it's a physical server or an individual machine, uh, individual virtual machine. Regardless of that, you're going to need a four-pack core license. So the cheapest you can license an Enterprise Edition SQL Server is around $28,000 paying the shelf price. Okay, that's just for a four-core server. If you buy it with uh, software assurance, you get failover servers. So it allows a customer to install and run a passive instance in a separate operating system environment for high availability, so in anticipation of a failover event. Okay, and you can have it for disaster recovery rights as well, so you can use uh, a backup instance of SQL Server for temporary use um, and use that server as dedicated to disaster recovery. But if you are doing anything on your secondaries in availability groups in particular, you will require a license for it. And you can see that can be expensive. But there is the concept of licensing for maximum virtualization, okay, uh, which allows you to run any number of instances on Enterprise Edition in an unlimited number of VMs uh, using the core licensing model. But if you're, if you're in a virtual environment, you have to license all the the calls in a host or hosts that can potentially run sql server on and that can be a way of reducing your cost as well as opposed to doing it on a uh, in individual vm basis we don't want to get too much into it but it can be uh, quite expensive to, to run all this stuff okay so that brings us to the end of the session we have looked a little bit about sql server clustering we've looked at availability groups we've looked at log shipping and we've looked at how we can combine these together to make sure our rpo rto and our level of uptimes uh, are met now if you have any questions i've answered some in the in the question pod already uh, feel free to tap them in if you've got any more you can email me if you want to, or if you uh, if you're interested or like any further information on the stuff we do, do feel free to get in touch. And thank you all for giving me your Friday afternoon. Question. Thank you, David. Cheers, Mark. So David just put a question, when would I use failover clustering rather than an availability group? David, I would use it with standard edition if I needed to have local failover Okay, and, and maintain a DR site. So I can fail over locally using the cluster, but with my limit of two replicas in standard edition, if I wanted a DR site as well, I would use an availability group to maintain the DR site. Does that make sense? So I've got cluster locally for failover locally, and then the ability to perform a disaster recovery too. Cool, some good questions there. Well, thank you guys. You can sign off whenever you're, uh, whenever you're ready.